Hello everyone and welcome to the 2020 Prime Minister's Literary Awards. I'm Kate Evans and I'll be your Master of Ceremonies today. I present the weekly bookshelf program on ABC Radio National with my co-host Cassie McCullough and we also now present a monthly book club program. And I'm delighted to be here because books, writing, history, poetry, analysis and storytelling are central to who we are, how we understand the world, both by confirming and challenging all of those things. I'd also like to acknowledge the significance of being here in the National Library, a repository for important manuscripts and collections of historical significance, and a site where new writing is both held and I don't doubt being written. And so we are here today to celebrate the literary arts in Australia, and in particular, the achievements of the writers whose books have been shortlisted for the awards this year. But before we begin, could you please make sure your phones are on silent so there are no interruptions during the ceremony? Really, double check right now, it never hurts. But witty tweeting is, of course, encouraged. Please also be aware that the ceremony will be live streamed today. COVID precautions have, of course, been put into place for these awards. This means it's a seated event. So if you are invited to come to the stage, please take your certificate and medallion from the table over here. There won't be a traditional handshake from the minister. I don't know about you, but I find not shaking people's hands very challenging and I haven't quite got the curtsy sorted. But photos will be taken off stage right in front of the banner. But I'm delighted to say, as we ponder both who we are and where we are, that today Wally Bell, a Ngunnawal elder, will welcome us to this place, to his country. Yuma, hello. Uh, as as um, I was just introduced uh, as well uh, as uh, Wally Bell, uh, not all elder, but I also want you to understand that I consider myself to be a uh, traditional custodian. Uh, that means that under our belief systems, which we get from the land that we're on, um, we are put on this place to look after the land itself. So we become carers of the country, uh, real custodians of the land. Uh, that's important for people to understand in relation to uh, understanding why we talk our, about our connection with country. It, that's the important part. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of... Um, rules and regulations that we live by as uh, Aboriginal people. Um, you know, we, uh, my clan group uh, are the Yar people. Uh, we are one of uh, seven clans of the Ngunnawal people. So to allow us to live uh, in relative har harmony, I suppose, without having too many, you know, Barneys and stuff like that, um, we have what we call communal law. That's L-A-W. Uh, so that's quite different to our other overarching law, uh, that's the LORE law. We have what we call our traditional customary law. and That's a, a law that operates right across the country with every Aboriginal tribal group. Um, that law is, is quite diversified as well. Um, when you look at, as I said, we get our customs and belief systems from the land that we're on. Um, our country here is quite different to Central Australia. So, you know, you've got to understand then that practices are going to be quite different. But that law says that we must do certain things on country. And one of those is uh, what I'm doing for you guys today, which is a welcome to country. Now, um, I'd like to explain why we do a welcome to country, because I, I believe a lot of people don't understand why it gets done. Um, it's because of the fact that a lot of people think that a welcome to country is just me as a representative of my people here 
standing up in front of you and saying, saying welcome to country, um, enjoy your stay. But really there's a bit more to it because under our traditional law, we uh, also must make sure that visitors to our country are cared for and protected while on non oil country. Um, we do that in two ways. Um, you know, it's going to be quite different right across Australia. Like I said, everybody else is going to do it their own way. But the way we do it is um, we um, offer up a protection in two forms. The first way that we're uh, going to look after you is by getting our spirit of the land to look after you in a physical sense, which means that as you're actually walking around on country, treading foot on country, our spirit of the land itself is going to look after you to make sure that nothing physical happens to you. The other side of that then is the spiritual protection that we offer up as well. Now, everybody here, you have your own personal auras. You know, that's something you carry with you all the way through your life. And you know at times that uh, that can be affected. And we, under our belief systems, we know that there's bad spirit out there, bad stuff that we don't want on country because that's stuff you can't see and you can't touch. But we know it's there, and uh, it actually can latch onto your aura. So you don't know it's there until you feel, you know, sad or sick or something on the downside. So we have to uh, remove that from country because we want to make sure that you're protected from that bad stuff. But most importantly, we've got to make sure that country is, is protected as well. Um, my way of doing that on behalf of my clan group is I make a bit of noise and I call for the spirits to come and join us. Um, the noise I make is with my clap sticks. country so I, I have a really close connection with the land that I live on um, and I can feel those spirits are with us. Hopefully you guys can too. It'll give, give you a really good feel for country, um, hopefully a better understanding of that connection with the land itself. As I, <laughs> quite a strong press as I can feel. Um, as, as I said then, the spirit of the land is now going to look after you as you're walking around on country. Um, and right at this very moment, our ancestral spirits are going around looking at everybody, checking your auras out, making sure that there's no bad spirit latched onto it. If they find that stuff, they just grab hold of it. Chuck it off country, get rid of it, because we don't want it here. Because we don't want it affecting you as a person, and we don't want it to affect the land that you're on. So the spirits then do ask that you do two things while you're on country. First one, really important one. You've got to respect this place that you're in. Look after it and care for it while you're here. As we have done for thousands of years. Second thing that I want you to do is also to respect and be kind and courteous to other people that you meet while you're in country. So if you do these two things for us, the spirits will harmonise with your stay on Nunawal country. So may the spirits be with you today, tomorrow and for always. I'll uh, finish off with some 
words in Nunu language. Dalawa, Nunna, Dalawa, Nunawal. Yangu, Nilaweri, Dunamayan, Naraganawali, Nyumalundi. This land is Nunawal land. We come together today for this important occasion. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Wally Bell, and thank you for your welcome to country and for that nuanced explanation of both protection and respect. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Unfortunately, the Prime Minister was unable to make it here today, but we will hear from him shortly. I would like to officially welcome the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts, the, Honor the Honourable Paul Fletcher, MP. And also, I would like to acknowledge our distinguished guests, all of the shortlisted authors and illustrators, the Prime Minister's Literary Award judges, and the Director General of the Library hosting the awards, guest Dr. Marie Louise Ayres. The Prime Minister's Awards brings together writers, illustrators and historians onto a national stage. They were established in 2008 and are one of the country's most significant literary events. And the authors are acknowledged today across six categories. Poetry, children's literature, young adult literature, fiction, Australian history and non-fiction. The awards value and acknowledge the fundamental contribution writing and books bring to artistic culture, one that provides a voice for Australian stories. They play a role in strengthening the profile of Australian literature and history. They recognise skill, creativity and originality and are a formal way to show that these words, these pages, these thinkers and artists really matter. I congratulate all of those shortlisted in recognition of your creativity and scholarship. And I hope you will all join me in congratulating our authors and illustrators. And now to begin the award proceedings, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the Honourable Paul Fletcher, Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts. Well, thank you very much, Kate. It is great to be here at the National Library of Australia for the Prime Minister's Literary Awards 2020. Can I acknowledge uh, Mary Louise Ayres, the uh, Chief Executive or Director General of the National Library, uh, Kate Evans, our MC, uh, Wally Bell. Thank you for that uh, welcome to country. Uh, and uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And most importantly, can I acknowledge all of the writers here, all of the nominees. These awards, as Kate has said, are about appropriate recognition for Australian writers and their works. They are the Prime Minister on behalf of the nation recognising excellence on the part of winners, on the part of nominees, indeed on the part of all of the entries. But it's also about the Prime Minister on behalf of the nation, the government on behalf of the nation, recognising and acknowledging the role of writing, of literature, of creativity, of imagination, of inquiry, of scholarship in our national life. And the fact that there were 562 entries says that Australian literature, Australian writing is flourishing. It is vigorous. We hear a lot about the fact that we live in a world dominated by technology. And the fact is that almost everybody carries around with them one or indeed multiple devices upon which they could, if they chose, write a book. But as it happens, most don't, because writing a book takes an enormous amount of work. It needs sustained intellectual, intellectual effort and discipline. So we often hear that there are enormous quantities of data in this world and that it's increasing 
in petabytes per year. My lawyer's understanding of petabyte is an enormous amount. But the reality is, the sad reality is that a fair bit of that data comprises information about the consumption habits of the Kardashians and other, frankly, irrelevant nonsense. And I think it's important that we stop and acknowledge something that's at the very opposite end of the spectrum from that, which is the achievement of all of the authors who've been nominated, the depth of thought, the extent of effort, and the quality, in turn, of what is produced. So these awards are of great importance, certainly for nominees and winners, but more importantly, in acknowledging and celebrating excellence in literature and in writing and in all that it represents as a key achievement of our civilization. So with that, I am now going to pass over to the Prime Minister in video form, who's going to give his greeting before we can then get into handing out some awards. So over to the Prime Minister. Today I'm speaking to you from the lodge here in Canberra, which is on Ngunnawal land, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging for the future. I also wish to acknowledge serving members of our Defence Forces, any veterans who may be watching this broadcast, and thank you sincerely for your service to our nation. So welcome to the 13th Prime Minister's Literary Awards. Today's virtual event has provided an opportunity to break what has become a rather unfortunate tradition. The past two years, these awards have been held at Parliament House and both ceremonies have been interrupted by less than melodic parliamentary bells. So far, I'm two for two for having to dash off to a division, but not this year. It would seem this year will at least be spared that distraction. Let me start by congratulating everyone who's nominated. You're our nation's storytellers, our poets, our historians and our illustrators. Your work helps to define of course, who we are as Australians and articulates what many of us feel, but so often struggle to put into words. You make it look too easy, but I know it's not. It takes countless hours, long days, research, hard work, and above all, a great talent. And this year, maybe more than any other Australians have relied on your work, I know I have, on your stories. For most of us, this has been a very tough year. A book, a Kindle, an audio book, has been the perfect retreat to escape into another world, to savour a different time or reflect on the ideas that are contained in your works. This year, one in five Australians are reported they're reading more often. And our younger Australians, our Gen Zers, like my daughters, are reading more than they have also. And I welcome that, it's terrific. They're discovering the remarkable insights that books offer. Books like The Happiest Man on Earth by Eddie Jaku, released only a few months ago. A truly great book. It's Eddie's first work. He's 100 years of age. You are never too old to tell a story. Eddie's is a harrowing but hopeful story of life in Nazi concentration camps, of surviving Auschwitz and the Holocaust, of losing family. And despite the deprivations, Eddie never lost his faith in humanity or the importance of friendship. At war's end, Eddie found himself home in Australia, where he was welcomed with open arms. He called our country the working man's paradise, a land where opportunities abound. But there was one thing Eddie said that really struck me. For years, he never wanted to tell his story. It was just simply too painful. But he realised that if he didn't, his story would be lost. And with it, with it would go the chance to make the world a better place, his ambition. And that's the power that stories have. Whether it's the lessons from history, the narrative fiction, or even stories for our children, each one carries a seed for change. And that's why what you do, of course, is so important. Your voice, your stories, show us what's possible. And we do need a diversity of voices, which we pride ourselves on in this country. I was very pleased to see so many Indigenous writers shortlisted this year. Of the 40 shortlisted authors, nine are of Indigenous heritage. Now that's wonderful, because we know how integral storytelling is to Indigenous culture. 
And this means we are now sharing stories that struggled to be heard for so long. When these stories are told, our Australian history is preserved, it's enriched. And that rich mosaic of what it means to be Australia shines ever more brighter. With it, the canon of our national life grows. Those stories become part of who we are and they make us a stronger, a richer nation. We are a country that believes passionately in the freedom of ideas, of speech and expression. Australia is a place where ideas come from across a very broad spectrum. They intermingle, they coexist, even when they may be at odds with each other. It's why for people like Eddie, Australia was heaven after the awfulness and the atrocities of the Holocaust. A place where people are accepted, no matter who you are, no matter what your race, your first language, your creed, your background, your ethnicity. So keep telling your stories. Keep reflecting and shaping the character of our nation. Congratulations again to everyone nominated and very well done. Thank you to the Prime Minister for addressing us today and presiding over these awards for a third year. And thank you, of course, Minister Fletcher. And now to the presentation of the awards. The first award for today will be the award for Young Adult Literature. In the Young Adult Literature category, social realism is the strongest linking elements in the works shortlisted. Notable themes are mental illness and the effect of the death of a close relative, exploring the ways in which people grieve and come to terms with loss. There are also these books prepared to show joy, warmth and humour too. The shortlisted books display a richness of narrative, authorial confidence, strength and complexity of writing and empathy for others. 45 entries were considered in the young adult category. And the nominees for the 2020 Young Adult Literature Award are... How It Feels to Float, Helena Fox. A nuanced, multi-layered and fearless debut novel exploring the intergenerational effects of mental illness, the complexity of grief and trauma and what it means to heal. The Honey Man and the Hunter, Neil Grant. An intricate and elegantly crafted novel that uses imagery set in a backdrop of saltwater and mangroves to lend new relevance to the exploration of identity and belonging. The surprising power of a good dumpling, Wei Chim. A reflective story of an Australian Chinese family dealing sensitively with issues of mental illness, cultural difference, love and trust, and the healing power of food eaten with family. This is how we change the ending. Vicky Wakefield. A story which lives on in the reader's mind long after the novel has been closed. It tells a story that is grounded in the familiarity of coming of age genre, but its execution and the destination to which it leads make it utterly remarkable. When the ground is hard, Marla Nunn. A poignant coming of age novel championing matriarchal strength this beautifully written work explores the marginalisation of multiracial people and the complexities of race, gender and class. And Minister, will you please come up and do the honours for us? And I'm pleased to announce that the winner of the Young Adult Literature category is Helena Fox, How It Feels to Play. overdoing my one minute, I know, just by being stunned. Oh my gosh. Um, wow, all right. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you so, so much. Um, I wrote a little speech. Um, 
Thank you to the traditional custodians of this land for having me here in the Ngunnawal country. It is truly lovely to be here. Um, thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Honourable Paul Fletcher, Minister for the Arts, for this wonderful award. Having a bit of an out-of-body experience <laughs> right now. Um, thank you so, so much to the judges. Um, this decision could not have been easy. This is a completely stunning shortlist, and it is a huge honour to be nominated alongside you, Marla, Wei, Vicky, and Neil. Um, thank you to my amazing, kind, funny, and creative family for supporting me through this wild ride. Thank you to the um, beautiful YA community for welcoming me so kindly and warmly over the last couple of years with such wide open and smiling arms. Um, thank you to the readers who have read my book, to those who have reached out and said how it, how it felt to read it and how it resonated for them. It means the world to think that this deeply personal story of grief, mental illness, Hope and love has helped anyone in any way. Um, thank you so much to my publisher, Pan McMillan, um, to my amazing editors, um, Claire Craig and Georgia Douglas, and to my editor in the US with Penguin Random House. Um, you were just visionary. They were just visionary with um, the way that they worked with me and their guidance and their support meant everything and it meant that I created something very precious to me and I'll always be grateful. And a huge thank you to my agent, Catherine Drayton, who had um, such a clear, kind vision for the book from the beginning. And finally, I did want to say that life is very uncertain and challenging right now for a lot of young people and they're feeling the enormous strain of that. And I believe we need to support them in any way that we can. We need to offer them stories where they feel seen and understood, stories that are compassionate, diverse, inclusive, authentic, and hopeful. We need to help build a positive future for them, and we need to imagine it and place it on the page for them to see. It is such important work, and I love that as creative artists, this is the work that we get to do. Thank you, thank you, with all my heart. Hello, then. From this way, we've got your... Oh, now we're going to go this way, so... We've got your eyes, and we've got a photo of you. The next award in today's Prime Minister's Literary Awards is for children's literature, a category crucial for introducing children to the world of books and acting as a conduit between adults and children and of children to each other because these books are so often shared. Each year, the judges remark on the many beautifully produced picture books, a testament to Australia's international reputation for high quality work in this area. This year, the judges were particularly delighted with a number of First Nations authors and illustrators entered. These books stimulate the imagination and develop an understanding of other cultures and people. 146 entries were considered in this category. The nominees for the 2020 Children's Literature Award are as follows. Catch a Falling Star, Meg McKinlay. A beautifully crafted, poetic and moving story of hope, loss and resilience. A 12-year-old girl who hasn't much control of her life learns to raise her voice and keep her brother safe. Cheeky Dogs to Lake Nash and Back. Dion Beasley, Johanna Bell. A seamless cohesion of verbal and visual repetition, energetic multimedia artwork and nuggety straightforward prose. This First Nation story weaves a sense of spontaneous immediacy to record the terror, warmth, excitement, grief and toothache of childhood and youth. Kui Mitigar, Jasmine Seymour, Leanne Mulgo Watson. A work of art that is beautiful and accessible with wonder on each new page. It lifts us on the rhythms of days and seasons and carries us on a respectful, reverent journey across Darug country and far beyond. One Careless Night, Christina Booth. This extraordinary picture book is the deeply moving call to action we need in an age of extinction. Intentional illustration and poetic prose confront us to consider our own actions. 
Winter of the White Bear, Martin Ed Chatterton. A superbly executed picture book with stunning illustrations. This is a simple allegory, but a strongly political story dealing with the frightening reality of slavery that affects people both in the past and present. And Minister, will you please come up to announce the winner? And the winner in the children's literature category is Kui Mitigar by Jasmine Seymour and Leanne Melville Watson. <laughs> This is amazing. <laughs> I'd like to firstly pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people and thank Uncle for helping us to walk safely on country. <laughs> we were completely shocked. <laughs> I didn't even bring mine. I'd like to thank our families for all their support too for this and everyone loving our book. Um, I don't know. I can't talk. <laughs> Uh, we'd like to thank Magabala, especially because for championing such incredible um, Indigenous stories. You know, it's so important for us to hear these stories and for everyone to love them. Thank you so much for everyone who has loved our story because our story is for you. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. I can tell we're all going to be in tears by the end of this. <laughs> now, the next award is for poetry. And I should say that as someone who has the great privilege of speaking to writers and readers, both in Australia and overseas, so many this year have remarked to me on the importance of poetry in this strange COVID year, the way it can distill meaning and provoke emotion. The judges tell me that the poetry shortlist was formed through invigorating and intellectually stimulating discussions aroused by the very power of poetry. This year, poetry ranged from the expansive to the very close. Meaning can sneak up on you in poetry in its immediacy, rawness, and even the grandeur of being human. It can help visualise the intangible, and that's really saying something. Now, 60 entries were considered in this category. The nominees for the 2020 Poetry Award are... Birth Plan, L.K. Holt. Linguistically supple and engaged in experimentation with language, the poems take us to diverse locations and experiences towards a new, more complete view of contemporary life. Empirical, Lisa Gorton. Cleverly capturing the colonial history of everyday Melbourne and its modern civic space, this impressively original collection of poems is open to the immediacy of a perceptive mind and free of any predictable topic or theme. Heidi, Pio. Impressive in its reach and colour, and using language that is accessible, playful and always vibrant, Heidi is an epic and engaging exhibition of artistic life in Melbourne. The Future Keepers, Nandi Chinna. This lyrical and lucid collection of poetry explores the relationships between humans and the environment, culminating in an idea of the future that draws on a complex and still resonant past. The Lost Arabs, Omar Seika. Deftly exploring the interconnectedness of sexuality and spirituality, ethnicity and identity, courage and terror, the vital poems speak with a clear, fearless voice that is often passionate and, if sometimes angry, always warmly human. And the winner in the poetry category is The Lost Arabs by Omar Seka.
Assalamu alaikum. Um, okay, I have a minute to explain what this means. Uh, my mother was born in Tripoli, Lebanon. My father was born in Jehan, in Turkey. And I was born in Liverpool Hospital in Western Sydney on the lands of the Cabrigal clan of the Darug Nation. I'd like to acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging, uh, and to thank them and through them, the land that sustains my presence here. Uh, four years ago, Peter Dutton remarked that it was a mistake of the Fraser government to allow Lebanese migrants into this country. Migrants which included my family. My presence here does not in any way ameliorate his comments which were racist and offensive, but it does give me an extra bit of satisfaction to be here despite them. <laughs> uh, and so, I would just like very quickly to thank the judges uh, for recognizing my work uh, and uh, to acknowledge the brilliance of my fellow shortlistees and to Pio, you absolute legend, I love you. Um, and lastly, if Peter's listening, I have just one final thing to say, which is Allahu Akbar. And now to the always highly anticipated award for fiction. The judges remarked on the adept writing of these novelists in their telling of both contemporary life and dystopian futures, often with wry humour and always with an astute and careful eye. These shortlisted works consider the effects of dispossession and the need for reconciliation the looming consequences of climate change, the legacy and incomprehensibility of sudden loss, the damage inflicted by childhood trauma, and the value and occasional snippiness of friendship. All the shortlisted writers this year are well established in their field and have been lauded for their previous works. This year, 106 entries were considered in this category. The nominees for the 2020 Fiction Award are as follows. The Yield, Tara June Winch. Showcasing a dictionary of Wiradjuri words, the novel carefully and lovingly brings to life the story of a fractured family and their fight to retain their culture, their land and their language. Observant and unflinching, this is an extraordinary tale of cruelty, dislocation, love and resilience. Exploded View, Carrie Tiffany. In this short, intense novel, Psychological insight, ironic humour and honed poetic prose build a dark, thrilling vision of a teenage girl's life in 1970s Australia. The Death of Jesus, J.M. Kurtzeyer. Crisp, spare and controlled, J.M. Kurtzeyer's prose is exquisite in his moving story of a life prematurely ended. Beyond the linguistic restraint is a powerful rawness that drives this stirring meditation on love, alienation, estrangement and grief. The Weekend, Charlotte Wood. A meticulously crafted, beautifully written novel about the friendship between three older women explores the sober realities of ageing with humour, compassion and tenderness. Wolf Island, Lucy Trelaw. The observant eye of the artist, the wry voice of the sceptic, and the wisdom of a writer who has thought deeply about nature, history and humanity create a bleak but beautiful dystopian future. And the winner in the fiction category is The Yield by Tara June Winch. was unable to attend and has sent an acceptance speech, which we'll hear, see now. Thank you. I'll keep it brief because I feel that everything I've truly deeply wanted to say rests on the pages of 
the yield. I just wanted to thank everyone in the room, my invisible distant colleagues for inspiring me, for the camaraderie and the unity in our work that is usually so solitary. In making art that is writing the song of what Australia is and what we stand for as a nation and particularly what we stand against. I wanted to thank all those who helped pave my career, my, my family in particular, Sue Abbey and Madonna Doffey at UQP, Frank Morehouse who was um, the first to publish me 15 years ago, thank you to my publishers Penguin Random House including Meredith Cornell, Rachel Scully and Ben Ball. Um, to agent Melanie Ostell, um, to the Australia Council for the Arts, um, and elders and Uncle Stan Grant Senior, who helped to revitalise the Wiradjuri language, which is central to this novel. I'm really shocked and grateful by how, how much booksellers and readers have really embraced this book. It's erased the distance and all those borders um, all this year I felt at home. Lastly, I wanted to thank the esteemed judges. I'm very, very proud to receive this award. I hope you all have a beautiful day. Thank you. And now to the prize for Australian history, a category notable, I think, for its ability to be both boldly creative and grounded in deep research. This award recognises scholarly works that contribute significantly to our understanding of the Australian past, be that in new areas, rethinking orthodoxies, or expanding established fields of study. The books shortlisted were chosen from a quality field of entries that covered a variety of types of Australian history, including social, economic, political, cultural and institutional histories. The five works that rose to the top of this category persuasively demonstrate the continuing relevance of Australia's past to its present concerns. History always matters and resonates. The historical narratives relate strongly to contemporary issues. 71 entries were considered this year and the nominees for the 2020 Prize for Australian History are. From Secret Ballot to Democracy Sausage, Judith Brett. Written in a deceptively simple style, this timely book relates the complex histories of the practices, policies and institutions that constitute Australia's successful electoral system. Meeting the Waylo, Tiffany Shellam. A path-breaking book about three Indigenous leaders who mediated between the Waylo people and the King's second hydrographic expedition. It is a narrative that goes beyond Eurocentric cultural assumptions to embrace the cultural worldviews of the mediators and the Waylo. Progressive New World, Marilyn Lake. An exemplary case study of the influence of turn of the 20th century Australian political and social reform on the American progressive movement. Sludge, Susan Lawrence, Peter Davies. This remarkable book draws on environmental history and historical archaeology to tell the dark side of the impact of the Victorian gold rushes, an impact that endures to this day. The Oarsman, Scott Patterson carefully pieces together the untold story of how a rowing eight made up of physically and psychologically scarred AIF servicemen won the King's Cup at the 1919 Henley Regatta. And the winner in the Australian history category is... Meeting the Waylo by Tiffany Shelton. Congratulations. realising that out-of-body experience that Helena was having earlier. <laughs> Thank you. I feel so honoured to be acknowledged amongst such rich, esteemed historians and writers. 
I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people that, whose country we are uh, meeting on and to thank um, the elders past, present and emerging. This book came together over 10 long years. I acknowledge the generosity of the First Nations elders and knowledge holders who mentored and guided me through the stories of their ancestors. These conversations shaped the way I could write this history. This award will help to keep the stories of the three men at the centre of this book alive, never more important in a year where we have seen so strikingly what happens when the lives and stories of black people around the world are not valued and respected. I'd like to thank the judges and UWA Publishing, in particular Terry ann White, and my family and friends for their unwavering encouragement, especially my daughter Lulu, who's here today. Thank you. If I could just, if I could just editorialise for a moment, what a fantastic set of shortlists these are. So make sure that you double check what's on all of the shortlists, as well as um, reading the work of all of the winners. The final award to be announced today is the Non-Fiction Prize. And the Non-Fiction shortlist is an impressive array of well-written, well-researched works and literary reflections. Subjects addressed in this category confront the issues and dilemmas facing contemporary Australian society, including abuse, Indigenous culture, environmental challenges, and the hardships and future of rural life. 134 entries were considered in this category, and the nominees for the 2020 Nonfiction Award are as follows. Hearing Maud, Jessica White. An absorbing and well-written memoir in which White reveals how the writings of Rosa Prade and her deaf daughter Maud inspired her to overcome her own deafness, alienation and homesickness. Sea People, Christina Thompson. A persuasive argument that deftly explains how Polynesian oral traditions have proven more historically accurate than the racially warped European interpretations of Polynesian origins and occupations in the Pacific. See What You Made Me Do, Jess Hill. This vitally important book interweaves extensive research with illuminating individual stories to explain why domestic abuse occurs, why it is so pervasive, and to suggest a set of potential solutions. Song Spirals, Gay Woo Group of Women. A model collaborative work between Yolnu and European women explains how systems of knowledge belonging to Aboriginal women in North East Arnhem Land are expressed through song and handed down over generations. The Enchantment of the Long-Haired Rat, Tim Bonnie Hady. A witty and persuasive argument about an often ignored Australian rodent, indicating that the decline in its numbers reflects a wider environmental disaster. And in the non-fiction category, the joint winners are Sea People by Christina Thompson and Song Spirals by the Gay Woo Group of Women. Congratulations. And these winners were unable to join us today, but we are able to see their acceptance speech. Well, this is just the greatest news. I'm over the moon. <laughs> um, this book, Sea People, was a very long time in the making, years and years and years. I had to learn a lot of different things in order to write it. I had to, I took a lot of classes, I read a lot of books, and then I had to figure out um, how to boil it all down and make it readable. Uh, I'd never written a book on this scale before, so um, I'm very happy to find that it hit the mark. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the Prime Minister and the Minister for Communications, and especially the nonfiction judges, for recognizing whatever virtues this book may possess. I also want to express my gratitude to the Australian government in general 
um, because it's not just writers who benefit from high profile prizes like this, it's also booksellers and uh, publishers and pretty much everyone in the literary ecosystem. So thank you for supporting literature and writing. I also, of course, want to thank my editor, Gail Winston at Harper, my agent, Brittany Bloom, uh, Tom Killingbeck in the UK at William Collins, and uh, Catherine Hassett at HarperCollins Australia. Thank you all so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jaun Dilmaymeru, and these are my mothers, and we are here in Yirkala, Northern Territory. I would like to introduce some of our families and friends, and they are Dr. Kate Lloyd, Dr. Sarah Wright, and Dr. S Sandy Sushit Peasen. We would like to thank RC. ARC, Australian Research Council, who have supported our work. We would like to thank you to Prime Minister and your government. Thank you, to Scott Morrison, for continuing these things, important national awards. <coughs> Given what we have done for the uh, House of this year in this country, thank you. I would also like to say thank you to our families, to our sons, the community of Irkala who had supported us through this journey and participated in the book writing. Thank you. And all of us um, would like to thank um, the whole of Australia. As Skywal women, we acknowledge the countries and her people, the indigenous peoples of this country. Uh, we humbly and respectfully share uh, our Yulmo philosophies and our stories and our song lines and offer this to all you indigenous people throughout our land. This is a first of its kind. Um, uh, we'd like to um, share with you the people of Anawal, the people of uh, the Banyalang nation, the people of the Mer, the Meriam, uh, the people of Arapwal, uh, Gaimangir, Eora, uh, Nunga, Pijanjara, Walpuri, Aranda. This is for you. Um, because we all think and we all know uh, this was and is and always will be Aboriginal land. And thank you, thank you very much. Well, having concluded all of our categories, can I once again congratulate all of the winners, but all of the nominees. Can I observe that there's a fascinating diversity in the range of subjects that have been covered in all of the works that have been nominated. And it is, uh, I think, an insight into the enormous world, world of creativity that is flourishing in Australian writing in all forms. So thank you, everybody involved in uh, organising these events. But most importantly, thank you to our authors and thank you to all who are here to support their extraordinary work. Thank you, Minister. Now, that brings the formal proceedings to a close. And again, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the Prime Minister and the Minister of Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts, the judges and all our distinguished guests. And I would, of course, also like to echo the congratulations, not only to the winners of the awards, but to all of you who received a well-deserved nomination on each of the shortlists. I do love a shortlist. It's a conversation and a to-be-read list all in one. Now, at this point, I'd like to invite all of the authors, both winners and shortlisted, to make their way outside the library staircase for some photographs with the minister. And when you return, please make sure to collect your shortlisted certificates from the table at the Book Plate Cafe. 
All guests here are invited to keep having their breakfast um, and note that the library will be open to the public from 9am. And those of you who have accepted an invitation to a tour, the tours will commence at 9.30. And of course, we also should thank today's Auslan interpreter for all her hard work keeping up with everybody. And thank you to all the guests, winners and shortlisted authors. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy lives and travelling here for this morning's event. Thank you. Thank you.